So, um, I hope you are ready for one more paper. I'll try to make it as accessible as possible because this is kind of, you can see it's getting a little dark outside and uh, we're waiting for the next <coughs> coffee coming up soon. So I'll try to do my best to keep myself awake and you awake. Uh, but uh, I wanna say one thing first about this and kind of trying to see the big picture here. And this is a two day uh, Sutskever event. So, and as we could see from these two presentation, very interesting presentation, there is this, there is a, a, a performative aspect to it, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is very important. Uh, it's, 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 not, uh, it's, it's not only, I'm not dismissing it, academic analysis and theory, very important in itself, but it also has this extra dimension, which I think makes this such a special uh, a happening here. And uh, I also want to say something which moved me, which is that Sutskiva is coming to life in his own environment, which is Poland and Lithuania. I think it's incredible. And it, it, it started to happen after the fall of the Soviet Union. And I think, as both of you pointed out, it's so important to uh, 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 read Sutskiva uh, in the context of that region of the borderlands because he's so much a part of Polish literature and he's so much part of the Lithuanian landscape and and that whole long uh, uh, history and we should uh, we should really incorporate it in to the study of, of his poetry so what I'm gonna do today because that's my training uh, is to look at the more Jewish uh, <laughs> Jewish perspective here, uh, and it's uh, and it doesn't mean that I mean I, I wanna I wanna I'm very open and I wanna learn more about this whole uh, uh, multi-ethnic multicultural perspective that is so important for understanding Sutskiver and his poetic uh, background. So, um, what I'm trying to do today is basically look at these stories that is called the Chorpen der Zählungen, the, the Holocaust stories, or as he called the first part of them from Green Eye Climb, Kurze Beschreibungen, the short descriptions uh, that we are blessed. We have translations into many, many languages. And there's even a, a guest from Brazil that in, uh, translated Suskiva into Portuguese. So, uh, and, and this is such an important thing for the afterlife. Uh, but we also, uh, what, what all this translation activity and all this scholarship is really based on is a deep understanding and knowledge of the Yiddish language, of the Jewish textual uh, uh, background here uh, that he really kind of uh, 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 drew from in his work. So, um, to kind of set it into context, what I'm going to talk about, now I'm finally going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, the, I, I, a book of mine is called Su uh, uh, Survivors and Exiles, uh, uh, Yiddish uh, culture <laughs> after the Holocaust, and uh, it's basically an, an attempt to create a framework for understanding uh, this group of Yiddish writers, historians, uh, poets that uh, uh, had in uh, many ways a similar agenda after the Holocaust and were inspired by each other. And Sutskever is a central figure in that whole company. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that the first chapter of my book is about Sutskever. He really sets the stage. He's very crucial here. And I just want to start with a quote from these stories because we heard in the first session a lot about history, the historical perspective. And these stories that I'm going to talk about here today, they're more in the aesthetic, they're more in the poetic side of the. But at the same time, they are very deeply rooted in a historical, empirical 
uh, as a, a, a reflection of the reality that uh, that uh, Sutskeva was uh, lived through in the during and after the the Hope. So, in a story called uh, uh, "From the Nivue von Schwarzaplen," and it's a, call, a story called uh, 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 it's called uh, "Rosen uh, 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 Blumen," I think something. I I don't remember the title of the story, uh, but it's from the Nivue von Schwarzaplen. There is a quote in that in the beginning of the story where he talks about. Uh, all the people who came to the Golden Arcade. He was the editor of this journal, the Golden Arcade, the Golden Chain in uh, Tel Aviv, that he edited for almost 50 years. And he says, In those days, tens of refugees were drawn to me, the editor of the Golden Chain, ascending on worn out steps to my narrow corner with their writings like ants, full of eggs in their mouths. They brought a treasure of eternity, the memoirs and diaries of their death experiences during the war and the Horton. If they were all published between hardcovers, it would be a library of the richest wounds. I developed a particular sensibility to be aware just from skimming the pages of the writings, a diary, a description, whether the manuscript was appropriate for inclusion in the journal because I didn't have the strength to read and live through everything." Unquote. So this is basically his position from which he writes a lot of his poetry and his prose after the Holocaust. He's centrally situated in the Yiddish cultural context as this very uh, a, a prolific writer and editor of the most prestigious Yiddish journal uh, published in that period. Maybe even if you take it further, you can say even in the one of the most prestigious and uh, uh, important journals, Yiddish journals in the 20th century. And we're still waiting for uh, somebody. I, I know that I'm sure there are theses about it, but we're still waiting for a book about this incredibly rich material that uh, was published during almost 50 years. Uh, and he was very meticulous editor. He read everything that came in there and he made the final decisions of what should be included. And all these stories that uh, were published in three separate volumes, in Grina Aquarium, Die Nivur von Schwarzablen, uh, and Meshir's Talkbuch, uh, they were all, uh, these stories were all originally uh, uh, published in the Golden Arcade. And uh, because that was the primary readership for Yiddish uh, <coughs> literature after, after the Hopen, and it was a transnational readership. There was a Yiddish land still uh, in, 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 there was an infrastructure of a Yiddish land uh, uh, even after the destruction. And this was one of the very important uh, gathering places for all the remaining writers. And uh, uh, the, you name them, they were all published in this journal. Um, then I want to address another very important topic, which is, uh, 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 of course, uh, the question about uh, 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 the rail the historical uh, reliability of a lot of these accounts and the way he is creates a particular and that is my thesis in today's paper a particular aesthetics of healing this is really what he does not only in the stories but also in the poetry and it, and that is what makes him such a remarkable uh, survivor poet uh, and I'm trying to demonstrate what it consists of and try to describe it. So, but first, before I do that, I want to give you a quote by probably, as I agree with Mendaukis, uh, the premier scholar of, uh, of uh, Sutskever's poetry, which is David Roskies, a literary scholar uh, who, uh, at, in New York. 
who had a, 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 a friendship and a, a correspondence with Sutskeva over a, a period of a, 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 a certain period of time. And he says in his book, Bridge of Longing, uh, so, uh, Rotsky says, in private conversation, Sutskeva sometimes, though very rarely, admits to other stories of Jewish mothers abandoning their children in knapsacks in order to save their own lives, or of Christians readily betraying their Jewish neighbors. Horror stories like these, however, do not document life's private victories over death, which are the human, humanistic underpinning of Messiah's diary and the storybooks that follow. So this is the, the point of, uh, this is the real, the, the, the kind of ideological aesthetic basis of his, uh, of these Kose der Tellungen. Sutskiewicz's humanism is in, based on an almost mystical belief in the power of the poetic word to heal and protect. Like the majority of Yiddish poets of the second and third generation born between the 1890s and the 19 teens, such as Janke Gladstein, Peretz Markish, and also uh, Sutskiewa and Itzig Manga, Sutskiewa was deeply influenced by the great classical writer Peretz and his humanism and progressive ideals. And it was, as I mentioned, it's not a coincidence that uh, he named this journal the Golden Cade. There was the golden chain. This was based on a title of one of Peretz's most important plays uh, from 1906. And Suskeva saw himself as a latter-day Peretz figure. Uh, he, had, he was an ambitious, uh, and he deserved that, uh, the bridge between pre- and post-war. Yiddish literature. <clears throat> in a 62 essay, Peretz Markish and, the, and his environment, Sutskeva gives an intimate portrait of the Soviet Yiddish writers that he encountered in Moscow between 44 and 46. In the 20s, Markish was a cult figure, a modernist cult figure in Slomatske 13, the Yiddish Writers' Union in Warsaw. After his immigration or I would say Aliyah uh, to the Soviet Union as a convinced uh, a communist in the late 20s. Uh, he became one of the foremost representative of the Moscow Yiddish literati. Markish violent imagery and wild declamatory poetics and you should read some of it, it's very kind of Mayakovsky style, right? Uh, left Sutskeva completely cold. Sutskeva's role model was the Vilna poet Moishe Kulbak, uh, who, like Sutskeva, came from Smorgon in White Russia and settled in Vilna in the teens. And it's interesting, he gives a portrait of Kulbak in this article, and it's also a self-portrait. Mm -hmm. Our city, Vilna, longed for silence and harmony, and at its clay-like gates another great poet stood God, Moishe Kulbak, the antithesis of Makish, an epical writer of universal scope, fresh as a fir forest when the tidy snow flowed down its stiff, hairy branches in springtime. An epic whose nature mystery in poetry can only be compared to the splashing authentic song of such a wonder poet as Adam Mishkevich, also briefly a resident of Vilna. <laughs> <laughs> Great, okay. So, just a little contrast here. So he writes in this essay, in his iconoclastic 21 poem, Die Cooper, which is the mount of bodies, the, the uh, 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 Jews that were killed during the Ukrainian pogroms after World War I, Markish provocatively led the victims of these pogroms, uh, uh, their rotting bodies, spit the Ten Commandments back in the face of God. In a you know, kind of a defiant, provocative, uh, 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 poetic uh, statement. 
in contrast, Sutskever points out that he, he expresses a transcendental vision of the Ten Commandments. And I quote from the article, and when the decuper, the mound of bodies, became ash, the Ten Commandments remained as eternal fire. So, uh, okay. Um, and I just want to, this is a very famous uh, uh, poem. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into because I don't have so much time here. I want to get to the point. So I'm going to go further here. Uh, how much time do I have? You started 10 past. Oh, so I still have 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, and, and this hopefully will kind of exemplify my thesis about the aesthetics of healing. And that is the treatment of the topic of suicide in Sutskeva's oeuvre, uh, particularly in the, uh, uh, in the detailing in the stories. There are several uh, examples of that in the stories. This is not a new theme in modern Yiddish literature. There are a lot of examples of that from early 20th century on all the way up till the late uh, 20th century. Uh, and um, there's even a book, a scholarly work about the theme of uh, suicide in modern Yiddish literature by the late uh, Janet Hatter. A uh, very interesting book, a psychoanalytic approach to that topic. But I want to focus on one of his stories, which is called um, Hintergrund und Abgrund, Background and Abyss. And uh, it's a, a, a very interesting example of Sutskever's aesthetics of healing. And the main character is a man who is actually uh, uh, attempting to commit suicide in the first month after the German occupation of Vilna. He's stuck on the roof of the Real Gymnasium. We saw that earlier. Uh, and this is the Real Gymnasium he, of course, went to uh, uh, 10 years earlier. Now he's stuck on the roof. And he's contemplating how to commit this, his suicide jumping out this way or jumping out that way. And the whole story is an internal monologue where he's debating different ways and trying to narrate what actually happened. And this is, of course, a retrospective narration. You know, he obviously survived. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to tell the story. And uh, um, I just want to um, read the beginning of the story. <coughs> Someone narrated silently and his friend wrote down. And this is very important. There's already that connection. You're, he's narrating and a friend writes down. It's, it's not happening in his head. There is a connection to a friend. Two times I committed suicide. Or as the purists would say, a single murder. And the second time I did not succeed. I know that your belly button pokes fun of me. He must have a screw loose. And he succeeded the first time? I tell you, friend of my youth, in crystal clear words, the first suicide I only committed inside myself, and that was the true suicide, the only real one until today. When I committed suicide the second time, I was already saturated in death by the first. Okay, let's unpack this. This is a big mouthful for 10 minutes, but I'll try. So, uh, so he's describing uh, this situation, this very uh, uh, incredibly intense moment, a uh, question of life and death, basically, standing on the roof. And he hears uh, uh, all the screams from all the... Uh, uh, the, the Jews that have been caught in the streets by the chapunas, by the catchers, the mostly Lithuanian uh, that caught the Jews in the streets and brought them to the to 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 to, uh, to the Germans, and they were they were uh, uh, they were uh, placed in the Real Gymnasium, and the next stop was Ponar, the execution site outside uh, Vilna. 
And he doesn't want to share that fate. He's decided to make, take his fate in his own hands and uh, jump to his death. And then what, is, what, what happens, and really the, 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 the actual, uh, the, the main part of this narrative is that uh, when he's ready uh, uh, to, to jump, uh, uh, he remembers the love of his youth. Miriam. And the reason why he does that is he looks out and he sees this tree in the courtyard. And then all these images from his past and his love affair with Miriam and his whole pre-war uh, 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 life comes back to him. And he suddenly split in two like a twin. And, uh, uh, and this is this double consciousness that is so important in Sutskeva's work, uh, the Zwilling. There's a story called the Zwilling, the twins. And he suddenly split in two, and as he said, instead of ceasing to be I, I became a double, both 13 years younger and 13 years older. And like in this story, the, the Zwilling, the magical number is 13, which is the birth year of Sutskeva, 1913. It's also, as we well know, the age of Jewish adulthood. And the last two number of the Auschwitz number that was tattooed on the woman in the story of the twin was 13. So this epiphany or introspective moment, I mean, he was very much uh, affiliated pre-war with the introspectivist, the Inzichisten. So this is an introspective epiphany that brings the spectacle to a close by constituting the narrator's past and future. And then, and this is the brilliant thing about this story, right? Then he jumps and the reader is totally shocked because he lands on the back of a German soldier, breaking the soldier's neck with his heavy boots. And then he's free. He can run away, and the rest is history. He survives. And um, of course, how are we going to interpret this? This is such a... So the attempted suicide is prefaced by this introspective moment where he reclaims his individuality and his past and his future and he's kind of breaking out of that role of being uh, 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 he, he suddenly has been given a choice and then the rest is kind of like uh, uh, not that important I mean it's a miracle that happens but that is kind of secondary to the first thing that happens and that refers back to the first quote that I read about the first suicide and the second suicide the first suicide was the real the internal one was the main one. The other one was, was, was kind of secondary. Okay. So, of course, we have all the symbols here. The tree of life is a traditional Jewish symbol. Uh, the, uh, you know, it figures many times in his poetry. We read one of them yesterday from Beimer, Machman Wunderlich, Papier. It's a very important, uh, it's about continuity. And, and, uh, and then... Uh, so the aesthetics of healing, and that is really the, the key here. And I want to go on, I, I, could, I could read a, another quote from Dan Miron, the Jewish literary scholar, which that's also, he elaborates on that topic, the aesthetics of healing, in, in his reading of uh, Lieder von Torbuch. But I'm not going to go there. You can read it yourself if you want. Uh, I'm going to go to something completely uh, different, and that is the whole concept of Kiddush Hashem and uh, the re-creation uh, uh, of a new topic. It actually originated in the Warsaw Ghetto where there was a new term that was being developed by rabbis there uh, and it was called Kiddush Hachaim. That it was more Im important during World War II to save human life than to go to your death, uh, a martyr death, uh, like in the traditional concept of Kiddush Hashem. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this whole uh, 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 Kiddush HaChaim uh, concept 
is that it has become much, it's become kind of a central uh, topic in Holocaust uh, <coughs> research uh, if, uh, associated with the term Amida, which means uh, it's a prayer in the Jewish prayer service where you stand up. And it's used uh, uh, as, a, as an expre uh, 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 example of standing up spiritual resistance. And I think what's important here is that there were a group of Jewish historians in, in the post-war era that actually published and developed these concepts from their own experiences as survivors, Kiddush HaChaim and Amida, and that has become more or less a, an accepted consensus in Holocaust research today. And Sutskeva, as the editor of the Golden Cape, published some of these essays by these Yiddish historians. And he participated in debate about that. He saw his own work as, as, as an integral part of that kind of Jewish spiritual resistance. And uh, the, the texts uh, in this book that I translated uh, are, I think, perfect examples of that in, in, the, in, the, in the realm of memory work. He continued this kind of very active resistance uh, in the ghetto, armed resistance later in the woods, but also the spiritual resistance in the Papier Brigade as a, in a form for an, a resistance, spiritual resistance in the form of, of this uh, Kiddush HaChaim concept that I've developed. And uh, it's interesting, he's very aware of this dimension, this kind of, I wouldn't call it, I, I don't know, uh, theological dimension to his work. I mean, he's a very staunch secularist, but there is definitely a theological, uh, 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 religious dimension as well. And he's very aware of that, and I think it's very much connected with these concepts of that I, I, I just uh, 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 sketched here in my presentation. And I just want to finish with the story, um, uh, uh, just a little reference to a story that he published in '73, and it's the story Mashiach's Tokuch, the uh, the Messiah's uh, diary, where he talks about uh, the the scrolls, the Megillus, that what, what is left really are these Megillus from that time. And the Megillus are really the introspective work that he does as a survivor to recall these memories and these images from that time and these characters that he met during these times that didn't survive. And uh, he compares that to the uh, Qumran uh, scrolls uh, in the Dead Sea, that were found in the Dead Sea in 1947, and he says they are just as illegible, they are just as incomprehensible, they are just as difficult to interpret. But he sees this as an uh, 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 example of that, these scrolls, these holy sacred writings from that times that he's passing on in his narrative art. And these, uh, this kind of narrative art is informed by uh, the concept of Kiddush, Hachaim, and also Amida. Thank you.